Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Meta Cafe. Grab your cup of coffee or your tea, and let's chat about astrology, human design, and what's up in the stars for this last week of August. Can you believe it? Oh, my goodness. I don't know where the months are going to. They just seem to be eaten up in time. And shoot, the summer is almost over. So and I hope everybody's enjoyed their weekend. I had a very busy weekend of football, and which was awesome. I love watching my grandkids play football and yard work and writing. And it before long just seemed like, ship, it's gone. And yet it was a full one. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I, I learned some really fascinating things that I hope I have time to share with you today, or at least I hope that you'll be able to understand in the context of what is happening in the greater picture of the astrology of the times we're in. And uh, I, I really, really, really want to share that stuff with you. And um, let's start breaking it down. Well, let's say hello, good morning to everybody first. Mimi, good morning. Colleen and Asa, good morning. Debbie Tibbetts, Tumiel, Allison and Debbie checks in and says good morning. So I wish you all a good morning. And let's see where we are. We start the week. God, the last week. Here's our last week of August, and we start it with the moon in Cancer. This should be familiar to you now by what is is going to be the uh, aspects that the, the moon will make while it's in Cancer because it will be opposing Saturn, South Node, and Pluto all in Capricorn. And we've talked about this um, a lot actually over the last few months, how every time the moon or another planet moves through Cancer or Libra or Aries or Capricorn, it triggers all of this reconstruction, deconstruction energy that we have going on. And in some ways, we should be really used to this by now, but I think for all of us, it is uh, just another little brick that we can put in the wall of building what comes next for each of us. And it may be on the emotional level, it could be on the physical level, um, likely it's in the emotional or somewhat in the um, mental level. If we may be rebuilding our minds, we may be rebuilding our connection to our hearts. We may be rebuilding something in the physical world around us. But also because a lot of this energy that's going on in Capricorn is across from the sign of cancer, which rules our emotional health, we may be dealing with emotions. And what does that mean for each one of us? And uh, so I noticed something funny this morning in, in Facebook, and I don't know if you guys have noticed it yet at all, and I have no flipping clue what it means, except like above your name, Mimi, it says anniversary follower. And under, uh, let's see, who is that down there? That is Allison. It says milestone follower. And the t if I click on it, oh, I can click on it. It's a Facebook badge. So you get a badge for following me, <laughs> Allison. <laughs> Thanks. And let's see, Mimi anniversary. Can I click on that one? Let's close that. Mimi's anniversary follower says, having a badge on Facebook tells people something interesting about you and you are also following me, which gives you an anniversary follower badge. Ay, yeah, yeah. It's like we're little children and we're earning badges. Uh, good morning, Lisa Pedro. And that's too funny. I think that's funny. So we have today the moon in cancer to start the week. We start the week then with some emotional energy and good emotional energy. It doesn't have to be negative emotional energy. It can just be that our, our feelings are raw or up on our sleeve and or our hearts are on our sleeves. And today the moon is in a really good connection to Venus and to Uranus. It is opposing Saturn today and also trining Neptune. So three out of the four planets that the moon comes into contact with today are really positive and invoke sort of good feelings and um, optimism, even in the case of Venus and Neptune both being there. It may even evoke unconditional love, and we may just feel like we are doing really well today. And even with the opposition in Saturn, just because uh, the moon is in a is an in an opposition to a planet like Saturn doesn't necessarily mean we experience the low wave. We can, 
definitely we can, but often it is the the good, the high side, right? Maybe we're feeling like we've come through the dark and we're about ready to embark on this ver this uh, 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 maybe next step pathway through the light. And if that's the case, then you guys might be feeling really buoyed by this particular energy and how it comes together. Now, as we sit and we look out across the landscape of this week, um, of course, the moon is always moving. So when the moon is going to move through uh, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, and then also into Libra at the weekend. But the big news of the week, there's three things this week for us to keep an eye out for. One is Uranus. Five planets make uh, contact with Uranus this week in a very positive way, a flow, a trine. A trine is a 120 degree angle between the planets and that relationship one is one of flow and it's a benefic uh, transit, albeit a little bit lazy at times. So this week we have Venus, Mars, the Sun, Moon and Mercury all coming into a trine with the planet uh, Uranus. Uranus is in Taurus, and we have this other this set of planets now moving through Virgo, and Virgo is a fellow uh, Earth sign. And so we have a lot of Earth energy running through the field. As we get toward the end of the week, and of course Mercury is the last one to come into a trine with Uranus, because Mercury moves into Virgo as we get into Thursday of this week. Uh, actually, was it Thursday or Friday? Uh, Thursday. And then the new moon occurs on Friday. That's the third big thing for the week. It is a high energy moon. It is also quite practical in all ways, practical heart, practical mind, and the practical steps that we must take to move forward. So to me, this is a really good moon. It signals a time for new beginnings, but in practical, organized ways. So have a plan and be ready to execute the plan. That seems to be the message at the end of the week, but be prepared for changes, be prepared for surprises, be prepared for anything. Anything goes when we're dealing with Uranus. Uranus is innovative, right? And it it brings us inventive, uh, thinking out of the box sort of energies. And it has a purpose, by the way. First of all, one purpose you could say is awakening. And so as these other inner planets come into contact with the trine, we're awakened in some way to something. Now, we also have another word working with us this week. If you remember on Friday, we talked about the word freedom. And freedom is a huge theme in this week with Uranus, freedom or liberation, perhaps, if it's way you want to, uh, is a, a word you want to use instead. What are we releasing ourselves from? What are we freeing ourselves from? In human design, we definitely see that we have the freedom to enjoy abundance in our relationships, in our money, in our work, in our opportunities, in our time, all of our resources. And today is the day that Venus comes into a trine with the planet Uranus. Venus is sitting at six degrees of uh, Virgo and Uranus at six degrees of Taurus. So they are working really well. And actually, oh, I do see that. Hold on a minute. I'm going to show you guys something. There's a kite working today. Oh, that's not that way. Let me see if I can draw it in here in a way that you guys can see it more clearly. Um, and a kite is always, uh, it's a configuration as opposed to an aspect. What's the difference? An aspect is, is just one part of a configuration. So a trine is one aspect or one part of a configuration of the kite. And I'm going to show you this here in just one minute. I can't talk and draw at the same time because I really have to focus. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here is our kite. You can see it's kind of outlined in pink. And the kite, so over here is Venus and the Sun and Mars. And they're all still fairly close together. Mercury's uh, in that area, still in Leo though. And then here's Uranus over here. And this, this line across the crossbow of the kite is a trine, 120 degree angle. And then you can see they both sextile the moon. Right here's the moon up here at the mid heaven, interestingly enough. And then we have 
uh, Venus here in a sextile, and a sextile is a 60 degree angle, and then also the moon in a sextile to Uranus. And then if we take it one step for further, we see Uranus down here in a, what, what is it configuring down there? Uh, interesting. It is a very wide, I see it's a little bit skewed, it's a wide connection to Saturn, and also Venus in a very wide trine to the planet Saturn. So mostly it's this upper part of the kite that we're really excited about in, as we move into this week because we end up with this ability to celebrate the innovative, to celebrate the unique or the avant-garde or anything different in our world, in our relationships. We have an opportunity to be, be the change, right? Be the change, to, to look at our relationships, our values and money in a different way. Right. What if if the the route to making money for you isn't working, then try something new. If the route to manifesting the relationship of your dreams isn't working, try something new. That's what this is about. Being open hearted and ready to experience intimacy. Remember this week, the sun is at gate 59, at least up until up until the 28th. That's just Wednesday uh, through Wednesday. And then on Thursday, it moves to the gate 40, which was also a gate sort of that was freeing us, freeing up our will power to be focused in the right way. We'll talk more about that as the week wears on. But for now, open hearted and ready to experience true intimacy. And what is true intimacy? And that might mean something different for each one of us, but we have the route open for us to experience that, especially if it's been something that has been lacking in your life or something that you really want to get to. So yay, right? The whole of this week looks like it's going to be a pretty good one. Now, as we move into Mars uh, Wednesday, I think it is Mars gets into the act with Uranus. And that, of course, could make for some exciting uh, pathways that open up for action. It could be um, it could be some conflict or something that also provides the the trigger or the, the catalyst for something new. Uh, later, it is the sun that gets involved, and that one is a whole lot more. Um, the sun and Uranus, when they come together, they they create humor, they create action. Uh, in a way that is good action, right? Get the good kind. Mars sometimes is tricky. Doesn't have to be, but it sometimes can be because of the the uh, um, masculine aggression sort of energy that Mars can represent. Uh, it could be that someone in one of you may be feeling aggressively uh, leaning into change, right? And ready to just throw off all of the chains that are binding you. And that may be a good thing, but it might also be not so good depending on what the situation is in your life. Um, the moon, of course, in a trine to Uranus can sometimes be upsetting, but also can be very juicy feelings, like something new that shows up in your feeling world, uh, a new emotional connection to something or to somebody. And Mercury, uh, ruling the lower mind, Uranus ruling the higher mind, if you will, the innovative mind, the inventive mind might be that toward the end of this week, we end up with some fabulous ideas, creative energy or creative impetus that we actually take action on, right? That we take action on. But by the way, Mercury isn't in that position until Sunday. So we end up at the end of the week and literally that is the first day of September. Can't believe it. So we're already merging into the next month's energies. And we see that that Virgo stellium then is complete by the end of the week with the planet Ven or Mercury having joined uh, Mars, the Sun, Mer or, uh, Venus, and Mars. So it is a busy, busy house. And by the new moon, of course, then the moon joins the Sun in Virgo. And that's what gives that new moon on Friday such high energy is the connection between those planets and that stellium of energy. Remember, stellium is just a word that means several planets all either at the same degree or so near that they're within orb of one another, which is a word that just means that they're close by and close, close enough to one another to be affecting one another, I guess is how you could de, de, delineate orb. And then um, we move in, we move Mercury, or uh, Mercury, yeah, Mercury into uh, 
that energy as well, a little further away, but still sort of close enough to be triggering some energy. It's like in the wings waiting to bring up our mind and our voices in alignment with that practical application of those creative ideas that we want to ground into the planet. So I think it's a good week. So expect the unexpected. Be willing to be surprised and excited. Be willing to see the humor in life and in the things that happen. Um, and I wanted to focus some our energy a little bit into human design this morning. There's a couple of things that I was thinking about, like when you have the outer planets uh, at a gate, they seem to sit there for a longer period of time. And that's true because they move slower. And we've had the planet Uranus sitting at the gate 27, which is down here. It is on the spleen, or excuse me, it is on the sacral and it heads toward the spleen. And it's on the, the very feminine side of the energy in this particular circuit, which is the tribal circuit. So it's interesting because we have Uranus sitting at the feminine and we have the sun over here at gate 59 sitting on the masculine. So we interestingly see that these two planets are representing different facets of who we are. It almost makes me feel like, okay, we're, we're getting prepared to bring the masculine and the feminine into balance in our own personal lives, maybe even in the world. Because, well, first of all, Uranus is a, um, a generational planet. It's an outer planet. It's transpersonal. It means it's not really affecting just me as an individual, but all of us as individuals. I hope that makes sense. And in that case, let's look at what Uranus is sitting at. But first, let me see if anybody has any questions here. Good morning, Suzanne. Mary Tapping Maskell. Good morning. Mimi says, LOL, I would rather see an eye roll emoji on Facebook versus <laughs> Me too. I think it's just funny. Jan Landry, good morning. Uh, I think you're new to us, Jan. Thank you so much for joining us live this morning. Colleen, good morning to you. Kristen Page, good morning. Linda Sachs, good morning. It's great to see everybody out there this morning. Allison says, good morning. What's going on in the universe? I'm in an amazingly good mood, right? It's awesome. I'm in an amazingly good mood. The sun is out. It's beautiful. It's just a beautiful day. We had rain over the weekend, so the ground is a little bit wet. And uh, there was even lightning at the football game on Saturday. That was a little scary, but it was going away from us, so we didn't have to worry about it. Um, interesting, just interesting energy, almost like, you know, lightning and storms clearing the air. And then it sets the stage for now, for us here in the Northwest, like two weeks worth of beautiful weather. Yay, right? Yay, cooler end of summer, maybe, you know, low set or up. Well, for me, it's always cooler because I'm on the water, but, you know, maybe upper 70s, low 80s. Gosh, just beautiful, right? And then the kids go back to school. It always seems to happen that the most beautiful weather of the summer <laughs> sets in as the poor kids have to go back to school. It sort of means to me that they need to look at where do they uh, get the kids out of school and when do they put them back into school. Well, good morning, dude. My neighborhood cat just came to visit. I can hear his bell. That way I know when he's trying to eat my hummingbirds. And uh, you might hear his little bell in the background because he comes to eat Sadie's food when Sadie doesn't eat hers. Um, and then it's just fun, kind of funny. Uh, comments. Let's see. Jan says, I've been catching it in the afternoons for a few weeks. This is my first viewing live. Well, welcome. And Linda, I know you from days with um, Authentic You Media, I believe. And you had a radio show with uh, Michelle Arbo and as well I did. So Linda, nice to see you out there. Kathy Miller, my stepmother. Good morning. It's great to see you guys out there. I just love it. So Let's take a look then at, let's take a look at the Pleiadian Earth energy of the day because I love it that it begins the week in this particular place. And it also speaks to that same lightning and storm energy that I was just talking about that clears the air and sets us up for something uh, new. And today's energy in the Pleiadian Earth calendar is 12 catalyzing. So for any of you out there that are new and don't know what we're talking about, the Pleiadian Earth energy is a calendar. I'm going to show you the calendar. And here we go, right? The Pleiadian Earth energy 
uh, calendar. This is 2019. And uh, I put the link up a couple of weeks ago because the 2020 calendar is in pre-order uh, status. So you can order it for next year. And I did already. So I'm excited because I want to keep that spiral of consciousness and that spiral of evolution uppermost in my mind. And the, the days in this calendar are in two parts. The first part is the universal energy of the day, which means that no matter where we are on this planet, no matter where we are in the solar system, every life form is in resonance. Every um, Everything is in resonance with this energy of 12. And 12 is the um, energy of understanding. And in understanding energy, we're able to understand one another we're able to step back and see the bigger picture and understand how everything is connected perhaps there's this universal energy of understanding then we have catalyzing energy today or kwayak in the um, mayan calendar and this is where we have the uh, energy of using challenges whatever's challenging you or has challenged you in the past, using it as creative opportunity. So it means taking a look at it upside down, looking at it differently and catalyzing a new direction. What do I wanna do with this thing that's been driving me crazy for months or weeks or maybe my lifetime? And I'm gonna turn it upside down maybe and I'm gonna see it in a new way and I'm gonna catalyze a new pathway forward uh, in, in something that I've never tried, in a way that I've never tried. Today's a day to avoid drama, stay away from anybody who's having a meltdown, or at least try to stay above the fray, and also stay out of overreaction energy. In overreaction energy, you've lost your free will to actually behave in a manner that makes sense, right? Overreaction. So stay away from anything that's going on like that. And uh linda okay good so i do remember you from the right place very good thanks linda um so that's about it that i can talk about for the week but now i want to share something with you uh yesterday i told you guys last week that i was attending a webinar this week and it was called uh the world at a crossroads the end of the bronze age as a message for our time now, for those of you who aren't historically oriented, the Bronze Age was the time from about 3000 BC to about 1150, well, let's just say 1100 BC. So about uh, that, that period of time where humanity was really joined in civilizations. We had the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Phoenicians, uh, Egyptians, uh, we had some really high civilizations that were uh, here on the planet at that time. And abruptly, abruptly, within like, you know, 50 years, civilizations crumbled. And the Bronze Age crumbled down and led into the Dark Ages. And then the Dark Ages, of course, lead into the Renaissance times. So as we, we move forward, we have these eras or these time periods. And as astrologers, we're always looking at the repetition of these time periods in terms of the planetary energies and where they were located during these times. So if we looked at the Bronze Age and we see what the astrological signatures were then, and you know, astrology programs, by the way, the more expensive ones that you the ones you actually buy, because I don't think I don't think that Astro can do this. Never tried it, but um, but astrology programs themselves, you can put in uh, a time period, like let's say 3000 BC to 1000 BC, and then you can put in what planets you want to see. So you could put in Saturn, you could put in Jupiter, and you can run that and it will tell you what planets and where they, how they were aspecting one another, and when is the next time that that major configuration will repeat. Okay. So when you look at that, when you look at this astral law, and by the way, this is from, an, not me, this is not my original thinking, although I would have loved to have thought of this. <laughs> it is a Dutch astrologer named Karen Hamaker Zontag, and uh, she was the one giving the talk yesterday. And 
So anyway, so she had compared the planets and what was going on in the Bronze Age. And wouldn't you know it that the next repeat, the next repeat of these major trans transits, the Pluto in Capricorn, Saturn in Capricorn, Jupiter, which will be in Capricorn, and uh, the square from Mars to these planets as we move through 2020. The last time those same things happened was in the Bronze Age, and the very next time is in our days right now, including even the major economic recession that began in 2007, 2008. And the last time, if you take it and you move backwards, the last time those aspects were in effect was during the Bronze Age, the collapse of civilization and the, the advancing of the Dark Ages. And it's scary. It is scary, scary stuff, right? Because we're looking at the demise of civilization now. Is it the United States that goes? Is it uh, the, you know, the economy of the world that goes? What is it that goes? And so you, I'm sitting here as I'm doing all of this, or as she's you know talking and we start to look at all of the things that were the same then that are the same now that are the stage setters for what has happened or what will happen and at the end of the bronze age for example there was this huge international expansion international insofar as the way the world looked then which was mostly europe and mesopotamia and northern africa moving eastward a little bit into the middle middle east so um, Iran, Iraq, and uh, those kinds of countries that I don't know that they were called that at that point in time. Uh, Turkey is also engaged in this, and so Greece, and Italy, and so on. And so the international expansion as people became seafaring and they were able to move goods back and forth and trade. There was a dependence on commodities that were produced by other countries. For example, bronze weapons. And then there was power and trade that was centralized in the elite, right? The power people were the rich people. The elite were the people of, that had money. And the uh, energy then is very similar to what is now. For example, when we have the dependence on commodities that uh, were produced by other countries, think about how dependent we all are on this world, on the countries that, for example, have uranium or plutonium or uh, what are uh, palladium and uh, platinum, the, the, the very constituents of our computers and our cell phones and all of the different countries that have gold or diamonds and these, you know, things that that we consider commodities that we want to be able to trade with one another and how that begins a shuffle of control over who has the money, who has the who has the resources um, in this time. Power and trade centralized on the elite in the Bronze Age becomes the power of corporations independent of the countries that they are a uh, part of. And it was interesting because I watched this thing last night. It was a, a comedian, but he's kind of a brilliant guy nonetheless. And he was talking about cruise ships and how uh, the companies, the cruise lines, did purposefully register their ships in small countries whose laws benefit them at sea as opposed to registering as a um, ship here in the United States, for example, where our laws are much more um, uh, in depth around the things that they can do, for example, labor laws, etc. So we have the power of corporations to operate independently of countries. And then that creates power in, in a corporate way, the ability to influence elections, the ability to set the, um, the discussion around what laws and so forth are going to be enacted. Um, we have the shift towards institutions and companies, for example, the EU, the European Union, and the big trade agreements and the countries that are banding together to create um, economic blocks. And we have multinational uh, corporations emerging without any restraint on them, right? A ship that gets registered in the country of Panama doesn't have to have labor laws that are very similar to the U.S., right? They can work these people on those cruise ships for 70 to 90 hours uh, in, a, in a week without having to pay them overtime. And they end up literally earning only about $1.80 an hour. In this country, that would never fly. 
but in Panama, or some of them are registered in, um, uh, what was that other country, that Norwegian, um, I'll think of it and I'll blurt it out when I think of it. So anyway, we have, we have these similar things background to the uh, end of the Bronze Age and now. There was also another factor going on in the Bronze Age that's also present now, and it is an internal rebellion. It is an internal rebellion as opposed to countries attacking a country. And, and I'm not saying that we don't have that going on, but I'm saying that mostly what began in the Bronze Age that really undermined the civilization was the rise of people in, um, in rebellion, destroying the institutions or going crazy, uh, you know, destroying the symbols of whatever they felt was oppressing them. And all I could think about was what was going on in Hong Kong, right, with the people in their their irritation about laws that seem, you know, that weren't being applied equally and they're, they're wanting to have more representation and how they were destructing things, centers, the airport seemed to be where they, they're not, and they're not necessarily destroying, by the way, that was, was originally set up to be a very peaceful thing. But these external invasions not happening like we would think that would destroy a civilization, but these internal rebellions where the center of government or the center, the symbols of government or the symbols of what is not working are being destroyed by people. Migration, that was also happening in that particular age. People from other areas move into the invaded territory, right? Think of what was going on in Syria and how the Syrian refugees are all migrating north and up to the east and to the west into the countries of Europe and waves of these refugees that are moving from one place to another and what fills the void right? Because then the people who um, take the void become maybe the fortune seekers or the people who set the tone for what comes next. And we have that happening today. We've had Arab Spring. We've had ISIS. We have religious factions fighting with the Sunnis versus the Shiites. And in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, we had, uh, we saw in the early 2010, 2011s, uh, 11, 2012, we saw all of these changes going on in governments and the uprising of people, and they had that as a precursor to the demise of the Bronze Age as well. Now, the biggest indicator, I guess you could say, of the what what um, presages a breakdown in civilization is complexity. When a system gets too complex, this is chaos theory, actually, here's the chaos theory. If a system becomes too complex, it will ultimately fall apart in chaos, out of which a new system can arise. That's chaos theory, by the way, I don't know, back in the day I had to read this book, chaos theory, I think it was written by Edward Lorenz, and it was huge, it was the butterfly flapping its wings in, you know, Brazil changes the weather in Japan kind of thing. And so we see the potential now with our society as complex as it is, easily falling prey to some sort of cataclysm that then takes out all of civilization. Imagine, um, I think it was in the 1980s, maybe the 1990s, something hit the I think it was actually a, a solar storm took out the electrical grid uh, in the East Coast of not only the United States, but Canada. And that was that was an amazing thing to watch as one after another substations went down and literally blacked out a tremendous number, millions of people without power. And how easy that would be to happen now, but if in a bigger way, right? If, what if we got hit by an asteroid or a meteor or something and how in a moment the collapse of our society would happen because of the complexity of it. We're so dependent on the internet or on technologies to keep us going, but if we have no electricity, we have no technology, and so goods don't move, and people can't do the same things that they were doing. So we have 
the possibility of this particular kind of collapse in our faces right now. Now, before you think, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Well, it is terrible, right? Um, we could go into the nature of, of into nature and the, the weather, the climate. During the Bronze Age, nature changed. It brought drought, famine, cities were abandoned. In, uh, even in the Maya, uh, cities were abandoned and no one really knew why. Um, plague and other illnesses began to, to make their mark and decimate populations. There was an earthquake storm of about 50 years where major earthquakes upset the ground and upset, you know, destroyed buildings and upset everybody's uh, worlds. Well, what do we have today? We have drought, we have famine, we have social unrest, we have economic damage, we have super volcanoes, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes that come into the picture. We have climate change presumably, right, climate change. And I, I'm an, not an advocate of climate change, but I believe our climate is changing. But is it in response to this timing piece that's going on as these planets build up this energy that the only other time in history that these things came together was during the Bronze Age? And we can see sort of what's the same, right? We can predict perhaps what comes next based on what we saw at that time but of course it's never exactly the same now i want to show tell you the good news the good news and this is a condensed version right this was about a two hour um about a two hour talk and it was intense and i haven't even processed all of what i heard um immediately by the way after i was done with this i couldn't do anything i had to go outside i spent the rest of the afternoon in the garden working the land because it was just so heady and so I was so in my head, I had to go do something with my hands just so I wouldn't keep thinking about all of this. So if we take a look at what was going on then, Pluto and Saturn and Uranus and Jupiter were all these catalyzing pieces. And they were pretty much in the same kind of configuration that they are now, but there's a big difference. And the big difference I believe, and this astrologer believed as well, is the difference between total destruction and reorganization, reapplying our values. And that is that Neptune is in a sign that it rules now, as opposed to what it was at then, and how that might affect us. And I think that means that we need to take a deeper look at Neptune and all of the things that Neptune brings us. I think Neptune acts as a, there are the high sides, of course, of Neptune, and then there are the lower energies of Neptune. But I think overall, what it does is dampen the effect, the the, the strength of these other um, uh, aspects to completely destroy and annihilate. And is Neptune the solution then? And if it's the solution, how do we work with our Neptune? And so over the next couple of weeks, I think what I'm going to do is start bringing a series of uh, webinars on Neptune and how to use Neptune. And because that is the one piece that was not in action at that time. And Neptune here would take us into something called non-linear dynamics. Um, little changes, little changes create big um, effects. And that, again, goes back to chaos theory a bit, um, the Edward Lorenz uh, deal. But if that means that the littlest things that we do right now in the positive have big effects in the world. I find that to be the most hopeful piece, that what we are focusing on as individuals, what we come together in community and focus on is going to be more impactful than the possibility of the destructive energies that we see going on in the world and how might that happen right it is those there are these unnoticed and invisible changes going on and that got me to thinking that got me to thinking because of course i'm a thinker it got me to thinking about the news and how we end up focusing all the time on the negative so i purposefully went in and said i want to know good news well did you know did you know that there is a website called goodnewsnetwork.org? And I subscribe to it and I suggest you all do too. 
Um, but I'm going to make a concerted effort every day to share good news with everybody that shows us the good that is happening on the planet, as opposed to the destruction, which is so much splashed on the, the screen every day. Now, I'm not someone that really watches the news. I do tap in periodically so I can see what's happening and equate that to the astrological configuration. But I'm going to switch it around now because now I want to see Neptune at work in our world. I want to see the invisible and I want to see what is going unnoticed by the majority of people, and then I'm going to emphasize that. I want to emphasize that. So here's something, a good story that I heard today, that I read this morning on the Good News Network. And it was an animal story, and I love animals. Who doesn't love animals, right? And the good news story is that the, the state of Delaware, one of the teeny tiniest states in our country, is now considered a no-kill for cats and dogs in their uh, animal shelters. And no kill means that in, in this particular languaging is that at least 90% of the animals that come in there live and less than 10 or less than that 10% that of animals that has to be euthanized. And maybe it's because they're too ill to be rehabilit rehabilitated or they're, they've had behavior issues or something and they just cannot be let out into the uh, public. And I can understand that, you know, some animals that have been so abused that they just can't be rehabilitated or those animals who are suffering from some kind of disease and they can't, you know, they don't want to let them suffer. So kudos to the state of Delaware as it becomes the first state in the nation to become 90% no kill. And I also saw a map of the whole of the country. And I'm gratified to say that my state, Washington, is right up there as well, with just a little over 10% of animals euthanized, the worst states you might ask, the ones where if you live in this state, you could do a lot of work toward that no-kill status. California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and then work can be done in Illinois, Kentucky, uh, what is that state? Kentucky, what is next to that state? Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I just lost my total. Virginia, <laughs> Alabama, and Louisiana, and Michigan they are also high in the kill rates. So if you live in one of those states, maybe you can do some good work there in you know, putting pressure on people to try at least the steps that take to keep animals alive, finding them homes, finding funding for the shelters, et cetera. But I was gratified to see that literally it is almost you know, three fourths of the states in the US have adopted this policy of trying to utilize non-kill uh, steps for animals in the shelters. And another good news that I uh, saw this morning, sorry, I was looking for the page that you guys were all on, uh, is that there was a woman, a woman uh, researcher who's found uh, what could possibly be the cure for multiple sclerosis. And it has to do with little, uh, little nano bits of information moving into your cells that create the immunity to that that trigger an immune response, right? Autoimmune diseases like multiple scler sclerosis are when the body turns its immune system against itself. Well, what she's discovered is a way to turn the body's immune system back on and to recognize the difference between what's good for it versus what isn't, and that they they feel like they they could actually have a medicine enact or a therapy by sometime in 2020. I thought that was fabulous too. All right, so let's see how people are are reacting out here. Uh, Diana Bulgar, good morning. Allison says cruise ships are usually the Netherlands or the Bahamas. Thank you, it was the Bahamas. Um, Norwegian and Princess are Bahama registered and Carnival is Panamanian registered, yet their corporate offices sit in Miami while they have boards of directors from different countries around the world. Yet their, their laws that they have to live by are where they're registered. And this is thanks to maritime law. And uh, it's an interesting thing to take a look at. And it makes me rethink uh, going on cruises. <laughs> it was almost sickening to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, my dollars have gone to support this without ever knowing the impact that this was having on people's lives. And it just about made me want to throw up. 
Uh, Ashley, good morning. Jan Landry, love the idea of a good news broadcast. I'm so tired of the bad news, aren't you? And I mean, if we, there's this universal law that says, you know, the, what you focus on tends to be what you create. And if we're focusing on the negative, then we're seeing more and more of the negative. We tend to attract more of that to us. Well, what if we focused on just the positive? We don't have to, you know, be totally blind to what's happening around us, to the suffering of the world or to, you know, the, the more negative aspects of what's going on in the world. But we don't have to focus our energy there. We can focus on what's the good. And our, like the, the Karen Hamacher Zondag said, unnoticed invisible changes happening in the under surface, like underneath everything that are going unnoticed by us, but are having a huge impact. Chaos theory, right? The little things that happen, a butterfly's wings have an effect on a weather system, which is huge system, um, thousands of miles away. Chaos theory. It was great to read that, right? To go, wow, yeah. So the idea is then even the little things you do, every little thing you do, has an impact and you just can't maybe see what that larger impact is. A kindness extended to somebody, um, a, a reaching out to somebody who might need help, a you know donation of your dollars to a, a group or an organization that does good works, um, your time spent with your children or your children's children um, or, you know, people in your community. So many opportunities for each of us to participate in the positive in our own unique ways and in the ways that make sense for you. Uh, Kathy Miller, I don't have TV now and don't miss it. I love the idea of good news. Also would like to see more mention of our youth. There are still lots of good kids. Okay, well, let me give you a good news kids story then because I read this this morning as well. <laughs> two little girls, two little girls. I think one's eight and the other is six. Get on Facebook Live in the evening and read books to children recognizing, they recognize that people, some kids in their neighborhood and some kids in their community couldn't afford books. And they didn't, they didn't have that good night story, right? Uh, you guys might, if you have kids, you read them stories before bed, a bedtime story. So these two little girls go on Facebook live at night and read their stories, their bedtime stories to other children that they can have access to these wonderful bedtime stories. I love that. And uh, they're actually getting you know, some traction out there in Facebook world. Uh, Jan Landry, life recently feels like chaos theory. <laughs> right, right, that's exactly right. You know, chaos, it's out there. And it, it, it seems to occupy the bulk of our attention or it can. Um, it can occupy it. And I heard a quote yesterday, and I don't know where I got where the quote came from. But as we watch what is happening in the world, and we see that literally, this is the passage from um, a, a, a more complex system into a more simplified one, um, the pausing of uh, the passing of the old and into the new, that the old, here's the quote, the old is a little bit noisy in dying. The old is a little bit noisy in dying, and that's what we hear more about, right? We hear we hear the noise of the patriarchy. We hear the noise of the uh, idea of separation and all of those things that, you know, are in the process of passing out or passing away. They're a little bit noisy in dying. I just like that. Um, and there are two great books that she pointed us to that I'm also going to point you to. One is one of my favorite people, Lynn McTaggart. And it's called The Power of Eight. And there is another book, uh, and I'm not sure that this is a positive one, but it's possibly called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. And it is a book about how the internet and technology is affecting our youth and creating this chasm between us being in community together and interacting face to face and those communities and groups that are online and how kids can get so focused in what's going on out there that they're not grounded here in the reality of this world. So there we have the short version of what I learned in an hour and a half. Let's do a card reading real quickly before I close up the day that, rec that uh, is gonna represent our week and see what the cards have to say today. Uh, 
I know I've given you guys lots of food for thought out there, but ooh, we have the tribe, and it was kind of upside down. The tribe, card number eight. Oh, and another piece of good news. The tribe, by the way, was upside down. Um, Suzanne Fulmer, thank you so much for sharing an environmentally aware search engine called Ecosia. E C O I S A. Ecosia. E C O S I A. Ecosia.com. Every time, it is very much like Google. I found it to be just as comforting as Google. Google, if I wanted a piece of information, I go to Ecosia, I type it in, and I get the same search as I do on Google. But for every 65 searches, Ecosia plants a tree. I like that. That's an environmentally aware thing. And I, as I looked at, I, I do my due diligence before I just fall in with things. And there was far more good out there, far more truth in it than what the people who are yelling scam, scam, scam is all about. So do your own due diligence. Check it out. Eco, e -C -O -S -I -A .com. Um, It is an environmentally aware search engine. Okay, so let's see what the tribe means in reverse and card number eight. So the general meaning of the word is community, belonging, being seen and understood by others, like-minded connections, a sense of family and friendship, knowing your place in the world. And the protection message says, beware of compromising your integrity in order to belong. How do you dim your light? or change yourself so others will accept you in the tribe? Do you hide who you really are in order to play a role within a larger whole? This will never fulfill you. Now is the time to assess your willingness to be real, stand tall, be you. Authenticity is true self-expression and the only way to empower yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself and step into the role your heart tells you to take. Making yourself small bears too high of a cost. Great words, tribe, the tribe, card number eight. Now let's get a spirit animal to help us this week. And then that will be the end for me this morning. Move that over there so I don't end up with the wrong card. So how? what's everybody thinking out there about all these things? I see Jan, what she said. She likes that theory. And I see Kathy, I, what she said, and about good news. Um, what does everybody else think? I see hearts and I see I see good stuff. I see hearts and I see laughter. I don't know what that's about. Oh, we get bunny spirit, rabbit spirit. And it says, now is a lucky time. Look at her. She looks so fall, right? She's decked out for fall, at least for us here in the northern hemisphere. So now is a lucky time, card 49, which is a 13, a sacred number. And then if you break 13 down, it is a 4 goodness. And let's see what this card means. I'm not sure. We, yeah, we, I think we have had bunny before. It says, a sunny meadow calls and rabbit spirit appears to lead you out of your dark warren and into the light so that you can participate in a fertile and beautiful experience. It may seem safe below ground, but the magic happens when you come out and take the risk of being vulnerable and co-creating something new. You are being invited into a new life that you have no experience with, but have no fear. Today is also a time to be fruitful and productive as you enjoy rabbit spirit's sunny and prolific energy. At this time, whatever you intend to bring to life will find fertile ground. There are no mistakes, really, when you are co-creating with spirit. So let new ideas spring to the surface, knowing that now is a lucky time of tremendous possibility. Wow, I love that card, don't you? So we have a lucky week. I thought it was going to be a lucky week right from the start because of all the Uranian connections this week. And uh, hey, good stuff, right? Mimi says lots to ponder, a good thing. Lots to ponder indeed. And uh, I'm sure I will share more about this, but let's just keep the good news going. I invite you to come on to the Living Astrology page and post good news right? If it will let you. If it won't let you, send it to me and I will post it on your behalf. Um, you could also go to the Live by Human Design group and post it there. 
And if we start doing that, then we can see the good, right? We can find the good news stories. And, you know, they happen in a moment. Sometimes you just hear this heartwarming story and find it and share it with the rest of us so we can start taking our little piece of that invisible or uh, what was it, the invisible or unnoticed and balloon it out and make it more noticeable and at least as important to everybody as the nightly news, right? More important than the nightly news, perhaps. <laughs> All right, everybody, much love to you all. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. I will see you here tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. East Coast time. Take care. Bye for now.